Welcome to Preventing the Top 5 HME Denials, the Q&A bonus session. If you attended the main event on May 30th, you know that it was packed with information, and Andrea and Joey couldn't get to all of the audience questions. So we rounded up the band to finish what we started, and it's my pleasure to introduce your hosts, Joey Graham and Andrea Stark. Hey, guys. Hey, everyone. You know, we just want to thank you again for registering for our collaborative event on preventing those top five HME denials, the proven strategies for success. You know, we covered a lot of helpful tips for managing those denials, but unfortunately, we did not have time to answer your questions during the live event. So as a bonus treat, we thought we would share the questions that came in during the live event and broadcast those answers to everyone that registered. Joey, you're with me today again. It's so great to be with you again and um, just glad we get this opportunity to visit with our attendees. Thank you so much. I love collaborating with you. I love collaborating with Mira Vista. You guys are an amazing organization and you're my favorite consultant in the industry, Andrea. <laughs> Thank All you. All right. Well, let's get on to the first question. Okay. So our first question is uh, regarding the CO16 denial. Uh, we actually had two attendees ask um, pretty much the same question. And it's about the CO16 denial with the N265 uh, remark code, which is because if there's a PCOS denial, there's a PCOS error. And so the, the claim is denying. And the question was, when working a PCOS denial and the doctor on the claim is no longer certified, can I get an updated order signed by a different PCOS certified doctor after the denied date of service? And once on file, resubmit the denial um, date, date of service. So that is an excellent question. Uh, absolutely. If the patient has seen the other doctor, that's important. If the patient has seen the other doctor, then you can absolutely send in a new order and uh, get that new doctor to sign. And once you get that signed um, order back and you get it logged into your billing system, you can go ahead and release that. However, I think the important thing to keep in mind with this one is that it's not always necessary to get a new order signed because a lot of times when this happens, in fact, the majority of the time when this happens, what there was an administrative error on the doctor's side, they forgot to recertify themselves. And so if you alert the practice because their own claims aren't getting paid, <laughs> um, they're going to very rapidly address this issue. And so a lot of times, all you need to do is alert the doctor's office. They'll say, yeah, we know we're working on it. Give it a few days. Once that's on file, you can go ahead and retransmit those claims and they'll be um, paid as long as there's no other issue. However, there are cases where you would need to send the patient to a new doctor. And that's going to be when uh, the doctor has retired, the doctor has passed away, or there's been a revocation, which would be because they, they did something they shouldn't have. Medicare revoked their number. Um, that's not very common. So uh, certainly uh, you can uh, reprocess those claims, get those signed by a new doctor. However, the most of the uh, in most cases, that's not necessary. All right, let's move on to the next question. I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Andrea. Yeah, it sounds great. I love the less complicated uh, scenarios where you don't have to get that order. And, and I'm glad that that's mo more often the case than the other. So our another attendee actually had a question about our number two denial, which was the 197 missing authorization. And their question is listed here on your slide regarding the recently changed MAP process for new enrollees with active services. Is there any recourse after the first 90 days or is that just a window for the patient to switch to a network provider? So again, this is a situation that assumes um, the patient's coming over with active services um, and they've changed insurance. And um, after that initial 90 days, the MAPS actually can um, enforce prior authorization and they can enforce their network standards. But thankfully, we do have that 90-day grace period as a result of the 2024 MAP final rule. So I love this new benefit. I think it's going to help with the continuation of care. It prevents you from being forced to take a coverage gap in your reimbursement uh, to try and coordinate on the prior authorization. But just to clarify, 
as long as they had active service under a prior insurer, that grace period um, is available to you for a period of 90 days. But following that expiration, the plan can enforce authorization and network requirements. Joey, why don't you take our next question? Sounds good. So our next question is also related to that uh, number two denial, the 197 missing authorization. Um, an attendee asked, when you have a denial for no authorization, I'm assuming you can't bill until you get a new authorization and use that new date as your date of service. I am so glad you asked that because that's actually not the case. <laughs> um, when you bill a claim, your date of service has to match your documentation specifically your proof of delivery. And so if you have, let, let's say you delivered something in January, but you don't get it signed until, or you don't get an authorization until March. Well, you can't just bill with a March date um, just like that. There's a little, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. And the nuance comes in, into play when you have to consider whether this is a rental item or a purchase item. So if this is a rental item that you delivered back in January, but you just now got your authorization, then the best practice recommendation is to go ahead and adjust off those earlier dates of service and add them to the end of the rental cycle. So you're gonna go ahead and continue that billing in March and you'll be able to bill forward and you'll be able to bill an extra two months at the end of that. Now, when it's a purchase item, it's a little more complicated because again, your proof of delivery has to match your date of service. And so um, let's, in the same case, let's say you gave a patient a purchase item, uh, something like a nebulizer, and now it's March, you just finally got the authorization. Um, and they won't retro the auth. That's another important consideration. Some payers will retro the auth. And when we say retro the auth, that means basically backdated. Mm -hmm. Most payers won't do that. Some payers will. If you can't you don't get, get what you don't it, ask for. <laughs> that's right. But you should ask. You might as well ask because sometimes they will and they'll make an exception for you. Um, so they won't retro the auth. Now you've got an authorization in March, but your, your delivery date was back in January. You need to obtain a new proof of delivery. So hopefully you're going to be able to get that patient to sign a new delivery ticket. Um, and, and then you'd be able to bill with that new data service. If you're not able to do that, then unfortunately, you're going to be facing a write-off unless you have the ability and the patient's plan allows you to balance bill the patient um, as a patient pay. Anything to add to that, Andrea? No, I think you covered it pretty succinctly, Joey. That was great. Good, good. Well, we'll move on to the next question then. All right. So our next question talked to, uh, had to do with the CO29, the past timely filing denials. And our attendee asked, do you have any suggestions on how to get the doctors to get you information in time so you don't get a timely filing denial? That is the, the question of the century for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but my recommendation is to act on the initial documents early. Um, the quicker you turn around um, and, you know, eliminate delays on your side, the more time the doctor has. But don't be afraid to set expectations and tell the doctor that you're working on a timeline. They're not thinking about um, what insurance the patient has. They've given you a prescription to say, hey, the patient needs this item. It's your job to get it delivered and do whatever you need to do. Um, so tell the doctor um, when you ask for documentation, incorporate response timelines um, and deadlines into your communications. Uh, by this, I mean, you know, ask the doctor to um, turn this around if you can get this to us uh, by Friday um, or by, you know, June uh, 30th to allow us to meet the patient's insurance um, deadlines and the authorization requirements. So help the doctor meet and exceed your expectations by letting them know this is time sensitive. Um, Joey, what would you add to that? I've, I know you've got a lot of thoughts and a lot of passion behind timely filing. Um, what do you got? I do. You know, as a, as a revenue cycle service, this is the, the number one thing that our clients get really upset about when they see those past timely filing denials. And all too often, the case is you've got a claim that's stuck on the hold or stuck in the open orders, and it's just taken too long to get that documentation. The problem is a 
a lot of times when we map out our processes and we build out our processes, we think the happy path. The happy path <laughs> is the path that says everything goes right and it moves right along. However, we all know that that is almost never the case. We have to kind of map out the unhappy path. And, and so what I call that is a terminal escalation process. And so basically, I feel very strongly that you need a terminal escalation process in place for your open orders that are holding for this reason, as well as your held revenue that, that's holding for this reason. And so what that looks like is, um, this is just an example, but let's say step one, we're gonna go ahead and fax a request to the physician's office, and we're gonna go ahead and create a task to follow up on that in three days. So we'll give it three days. Now it hasn't come back. So now we're gonna to move to step two. Step two is we're gonna fax a second request. We're gonna mark it as a second request. And we're gonna give it, let's say two days to respond. So we're gonna update our task. We're gonna add two more days. Now, two days later, we're gonna follow up. It's still not back. Okay, let's move to step three. Step three is we're gonna roll a sales rep into that office. And we're gonna say, you go talk to that, you know, that nurse or that uh, the front office or whoever you need to talk to and get this documentation back. We're gonna give you two days, three days to, to get that, that back, right? So we send the rep, we, we update our task, another two or three days goes by, still not back. Okay, and in the two, three days is totally up to you. Some companies might have a week between each step. The important thing is that you have something, that it's a standardized process that your team follows consistently. So, all right, the sales rep didn't work, now we're moving on to step four. Step four is we're gonna actually have to contact the patient. And we're going to say, Mr. Patient, I'm so sorry to bug you. Uh, we're having a hard time getting this documentation from your doctor's office. I hate to do this, but I need to ask for your assistance. Will you please call your doctor's office for us and ask them to fax over the documentation we've requested? Uh, we've actually requested it three times now. So um, unfortunately, Mr. Patient, if we don't get this documentation back, we're not going to be able to bill your insurance. And so you're either going to have to return that product or you're gonna to have to pay out of pocket for it. So, all right, Mr. Patient, we update our, our notes. We're gonna give them, let's say three days. So three days later, we follow up again, still no documentation. All right, so now based on the way the, the patient responded to that conversation, we're either gonna schedule a return or we're gonna go ahead and proceed with the out of pocket. But let's say they wanted, they said, okay, I'll return the equipment. So now we're gonna schedule that return, that's step five, and we're gonna inform the patient, you have got you know, two, three, however many days you wanna say to get that, that product returned. So again, we set another task, give it another few days, patient hasn't returned the equipment, we still don't have documentation, so now what? Now we get to that terminal step. The terminal step in this case is um, we're gonna bill the patient. And um, you may be thinking, but Joey, the patient has Medicare. We can't bill the patient. No, that's actually not the case. There is actually a process for unsigned ABNs. Uh, we will provide it with uh, the, the materials that are uh, we're going to send out from this. But there is a whole process you can follow to get an ABN filled out without the patient's signature, which will allow you then to bill the patient. Mm -hmm. so transfer the balance to the patient and allow your patient pay process to, to handle it from there, right? So that six step was the last step. Now it's done. If I'm on the intake team or I'm on the hold team, I'm not gonna mess with this again. Yeah. Um, Andrea, let's move on to the next one. Yeah, and I will just add one thing to the um, the ABN um, uh, protocol because that is a good one. We can do those unsigned ABNs, but the key is is you had to have educated the patient why um, they are responsible and and the efforts that you've tried to go to and exhausted, and you have explained that the patient um, requires authorization, can't get authorization, and um, so to continue with the equipment, they know they are fully responsible. Once the patient knows that. They don't have to put their John Hancock or Jane Hancock onto that form to be held accountable. So um, that's a, a great tool and great, um, you know, technique. And again, that terminal or the off ramp where everything does culminate in this one thing and we are going to get paid or we're going to have our equipment. That's critical to the process. Why don't I take us to our next question then? So 
Our next question was kind of more of a general question. And um, the attendee asked, is it problematic with Medicare if you get a lot of denials? Um, and for this particular question, um, you know, it's it's a great question. Um, I think a lot of our attendees would have been interested to hear this dialogue, but denial activity is definitely one of the metrics that Medicare uses as an indicator for when patient or suppliers rather um, might be in need of education and training. And more and more of their efforts are targeted towards this end. Um, they want to help you get a good result and to build compliantly. And they've built a lot of education around and provided suppliers with tools. But when it's really, really high, it absolutely can be an indicator of potential fraud or abuse. But again, for most suppliers, that's not really their situation. The denial volume would really need to be significant in comparison to the number of paid claims to merit direct intent, uh, intervention or um, scrutiny. Um, denials in an audit situation changes that trajectory, um, then it does become problematic. So if you're under a RAC audit or a TPE audit um, or a CERT audit and you have errors, um, that will be a problem. There are consequences that range from additional rounds of audits, more fun things to, to respond to. Um, they can refer you to CMS, um, even up to PTAN revocation, uh, which we certainly want to avoid. Um, you don't need to worry about the onesie twosie or we didn't get a perfect score the first round. What matters is that you learn from it, you adapt, and you grow. Um, that's what they're really um, focused in on. Um, and it's less about those um, individual denials. They monitor types of denials, though, um, and there was a very high profile case um, just a couple of years ago where a competitive bid supplier, um, you know, was sending out diabetic supplies and um, had some billing patterns where a lot of times they were billing after the patient's date of death. And on a supply, that shouldn't really happen that often. That showed a pattern of neglect. And those denial patterns um, do focus and feature in OIG reports as fraudulent, abusive billing and in stream cases can result in PTAN revocation. But again, you can't always predict that the patient is going to pass away. So when you're in the rental business and you get a CO13 denial because the patient passed away, then when you learn of that, you just need to have a process to go and look back and see, did any of our rentals pay when they shouldn't have? Because we learned about the date of death now, but did our last claim pay when it shouldn't have? And if you are in the process of refunding those um, erroneous claims, you're not going to be one of those featured suppliers that is, um, you know, in jeopardy of losing their PTAN. But Joey, you see a lot of claim activity with the transactions you handle. So I, what, do you, what, what can you add to this? Sure. You know, I, I love what you just said. Um, and I would say another aspect to really watch as a supplier is your claims volume for different HIC picks. So let's say, for example, you um, typically bill 100, 150 wheelchairs a month, and then all of a sudden you start billing 1,000 wheelchairs a month. That is going to be a big flag for Medicare, and you're almost certainly going to get a handful of development letters from them. They're testing the water with this. So they're going to send you these development letters, and your success in passing these developments is critical to you continuing to get paid because if you don't, then you will almost certainly end up on a prepay audit. So um, I think that's really important as well. It's not just the quantity of denials that we send, but it's also the quantity of claims that we send by HICPIC and that we don't cause ourselves to be a major outlier and get their attention. That's so right. even if you did have the real uptick in business, I don't know what happened. Something happened. Now all of a sudden you're doing a whole lot more of this product. The best, pro the best practice is to ease into it you know, increase that volume slowly over time so that you don't end up um, becoming an outlier. All right. Well, I think that does it for all of our questions, Joey. How do our attendees get in touch and uh, with you about the ProChance services? Absolutely. You know, you suppliers, you work hard to earn your revenue and you can count on us to bring it home. With 25 years of experience in HME, DME revenue cycle management, 
ProChain is a leader in outsourced intake, billing, and collections. That's because we provide the highest level of service, full vis visibility, and advanced technologies to ensure that our customers capture maximum rev revenue in a cost-effective way. Um, and you'll see my contact information on uh, the, the last slide. Um, how about you, Andrea? How do people get in touch with uh, Mira Vista? Well, you know, um, we have a wonderful QR code here where you can, um, you know, get in touch with us, um, connect with our services. You know, we covered a lot of information in our webinar and our sincere hope is that you took away some great ideas that can be deployed in some fashion in your operation. But we are here for you. You are not alone when you get into um, the end of this recording at our firm. We have a team of experienced billers and researchers that are at the ready to help you build and maintain reimbursement mastery that you need for successful billing. Whether you bill in-house or whether you manage a multifaceted ecosystem with outsourced partners like Joey and the team at ProChant. So to find out if we can help you with our scripted training programs or our no-charge consulting, you can email us or um, look us up on Facebook or not Facebook, rather LinkedIn. That's where we're at. Andrea Stark DME on LinkedIn. Joey, you have anything you want to add before we close out our session? No, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to watch this. Um, it's been a great experience collaborating with Mira Vista, and um, I hope you got something really good out of this. So thank you all for your time today. Absolutely. And I appreciate having yet another opportunity to collaborate with you, Joey. Until next time, take care, everyone. Thank you.